Greetings, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Lynn Gilliland, and so grateful to be here with Shelley Good, who is with Oxfam, I, Oxfam America. I will let her talk about what her, what the work is that she's doing and where she's coming from to join us. We had a pre-conversation uh, before we had um, we had this one, and I felt so grateful that she was referred to me as someone that we could capture her lessons because I, I there was just some of the nuggets that she was giving me in the pre-interview that I hope that we get to today. Uh, Shelley has a very rich, diverse background, somewhat unusual for the um, international non-governmental world. So we're grateful to have you here, Shelley. And I was wondering if you could just start by saying, get telling us about your background. Uh, well, thank you, Lynn, for that introduction. Uh, I am a fundraiser. I've been a fundraiser for many years since I uh, had my first internship in college where I interned with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. And uh, over the years, I've remained a fundraiser, but I have um, traveled in different uh, nonprofit environments. So I've worked at the Smithsonian Institution. I opened a children's museum in Baltimore. Uh, I was lucky enough to work at Spelman College. And um, I, am, I worked at Volunteers of America, which is a uh, large um, health and human service organization over 100 years old and now I'm at Oxfam America uh, in charge of raising money for Oxfam America and Oxfam is part of a global confederation working to end the injustice of poverty. And um, was that a big transition for you to go from those other types of nonprofits to Oxfam? Was, did it feel like a big shift or? Because I've uh, been in different spaces, um, it didn't feel like a huge shift. There is a different element. The international element is certainly different. And, uh, but I have had to carry my experiences gained in different organizations to um, uh, the organizations where I would land. And so I found that that transition felt organic, but the international um, sight lines provided a new learning opportunity for me. Mm -hmm. And when we talked before, you were talking about taking risks. You were talking about first going to Spelman and then um, taking the risk to go live in Atlanta. And at least the way I remember it is you framed your life as one of having, of taking risks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I've been, uh, lucky enough to have had the opportunity to take risk. And um, I think also have been um, felt empowered enough to take those risks. And when I think of um, going to Spelman, I had a home in Baltimore, but I was contacted by the college and um, I was working in, at Syracuse, uh, um, at the Syracuse Symphony at the time but I met Dr. Janetta Cole in, in New York. And if for anyone who doesn't know her, I would suggest looking her up. She is a phenomenal uh, Shiro, as she would call herself. And uh, I remember coming back saying, I need to work there. And uh, it was also something that I felt like I could bring the experience that I gained in other institutions when I worked at Hopkins and to take that experience to an historically black college. And so that was something that um, was very meaningful to me and uh, to have that experience and to work with them uh, in their first big um, capital campaign. And so what, what of all those experiences do you bring to Oxfam that maybe a traditional non-governmental wouldn't know or what's the fresh breeze that you bring in? You know, when you've worked in different nonprofit environments, you have to learn to pivot very quickly. 
and you also understand that um, no matter how established an organization is, they can be um, have a startup feel. And uh, I always enter into those spaces because I've been in startups um, and even in established organizations, I just assume that there is um, a startup element to the change you need to bring to the table. And so I think that my experience, um, that's what I bring to Oxfam is understanding that you have to um, be willing to be a little disruptive while honoring the past uh, and also understanding that um, change is really the engine for the future and, uh, and how to encourage people to feel you know, trusting enough that they too can be a part of that change. And so that's what I think I've brought to Oxfam, kind of bringing your outside lens, looking from the outside in and um, a, a fresher perspective. So I, I want to know the secret of how you be a little disruptive and honor the past. Um, oh, it's a great but, question. Yeah, because that I would love to learn that myself. Mm -hmm. uh, after, you know, some mistakes, I, I have to say that I've learned that you need to help people understand that you're not saying that what took place in the past is wrong mm -hmm. um, and that you are celebrating uh, how their successes in getting an organization to where it is at the moment. Um, but then you start asking a question and I use this image of, um, there's a favorite image I use, it's a road and there's a question mark at the end of the road. And um, I pose the question, what if? And that what if can be many things. So what if we try something different? What if you ask yourself, is there something else that you would have liked to have done differently in the past that could have improved mm -hmm. uh, performance? What if we tried something a little differently? So asking the question pulls people into the process as opposed to dictating what should happen. And I find that that opportunity of co-creation is a way of both honoring building, since people feel like you're building on the past, but then you're also um, creating a, another um, uh, jumping off point for, for them and for the, the organization to try new things and to move forward. And I like the, the what if you're not saying this is not working or this is wrong or you're just yeah. saying here's the road. What if we did this? What if we looked at it this way? What if we looked at it that way? There's no judgment there. Yes, there's there's yeah. no judgment. Yeah. And and you understand too, and I use this uh, image and we had a retreat a couple of weeks ago that the road is divided in two. Some people are walking straight down the middle on the straight lines. Other people are zigzagging across the lines. There's some people standing on the grassy sides of the road. Uh, but, you know, eventually, if you're still moving, moving towards that question mark, um, it's okay how you, you can get there in different ways, but then you have to feel like you are part of a collective moving in, in the same way, but you don't have to move, moving in the same direction, but not in the same way. I'm going to ask you something that we didn't talk about. It's in my mind. So it might feel like a left turn, okay. Shelley, I'm sorry. <laughs> What do you what do you think about scaling leadership? Like if you wanted to scale your 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 people that report to you, scale your let's just start there. How do you scale people's leadership abilities or growth? Because if they don't scale, you're not going to be able to get to the what if the vision down the road. Mm -hmm. Um that's a great question. I uh, try to look at the talents of the people in in front of me, and um, 
And I also understand that it is my role to create an environment where people feel like they can both succeed and that they have the opportunity to fail. Mm. And if there is that understanding of trust, um, that is the way you start to scale and unleash leadership. And um, I also let, I mean, I think I create an environment where people understand that they can own um, streams of work and it has nothing to do with title. Um, titles are not, uh, you know, we are not rigidly bound by title. We are looking at the way work should be done, ways of working. And with that, you're creating a team environment. And in that teaming environment, it's less hierarchical. And uh, that is a way you really pull people together and you are helping people to lead where they, from where they sit. Um, and I find that that is both a way of empowering people, but also provides a demonstration for others in the organization um, to uh, give an example of how you can be working, particularly with a younger cohort, um, so that they feel like they are, they are in these leadership positions. They are not bound by um, an artificial um, title or they're not siloed, that you really are. The way to unleash talent is to create a teaming environment that is both authentic and where everyone is holding each other accountable for the success of the group. And, and that's definitely what the literature says and my own experience. It seems hard to get there, to have a team hold itself accountable. Mm -hmm. um, and to the way you're describing it, it feels like the roles are unclear, like not, you know, people really want this is my role and that's your role. And, and that sounds like that's not as defined. So somehow, if I'm understanding it, somehow it works without having people in their boxes. Yeah, and there, there is, uh, there's a design element here as well. So I, if I could use an example, we um, combined our major gift team and our mid-level teams. And in, with that proposition, I came to the group with an initial design saying, I think that it could look like this, two teams um, with people on teams uh, reporting to um, a team leader in their teaming spaces, but they could have an HR reporting line to others. Um, and, but I said, I'm going to step away. You may come up with a different construct. Mm. And, uh, and with that, and with facilitation, they did come up with a different construct. And, you know, with me coming in to be consulted, but they designed this team. Um, and they created norms for how meetings should be run. They created the, the team goals. They created, um, um, refreshed and uh, created work streams connected to how they needed to work together, be fully integrated. And so that was not my design, um, but it was one that I could support. And I was the one, you know, where they would come back and say, well, this is where we are now. And I think that, that there is actually more clarity in this teaming um, structure that's led by uh, a young woman who has tremendous potential. Um, and, but it's also unleashed and unlocked others to take ownership. I mean, I've just watched this group take on things that you never would have imagined. And uh, so there's more clarity than you would presume would be when you're thinking of a teaming structure where it may be self-directed. But what you, what you did is you gave them the, con, uh, the container and they went and then they were free to within that and they, all the structures helped, the norms, you know, coming up with the norms, their goals. Um, and then I'm assuming then that helps with holding each other accountable since they did it, since they created it. 
Yes. Since they have that ownership over it. Yes. Um, they hold themselves accountable. There are team goals. And then in individual goals, those team goals are reflected in their individual goals. So it was a lot of hard work to get the structure um, in place and then to really perfect the new way of working, but um, it has really reaped tremendous benefits, not only for our team, but um, for the organization in demonstrating the way that um, the organization needs to move when we think about the workforce of the future and our own future um, connected to our strategic plan. I would love to delve into that more and use that as a model elsewhere. And I wanted to circle back to, you talked about failure, one of my favorite subjects, not because I like failing or <laughs> at all, but there's so much um, richness, it seems to me, in failure. And when I ask leaders about their experience of failure and how they think about failure, that's been some of the the gems I think that the, everyone can learn from. So what do you think about failure? Um, you know, when I was younger, I was offended by failure. Mm. And um, it was something that I uh, just found unacceptable. And I didn't think that you should fail um, and as I've continued to my own path, um, I learned that failure is both an opportunity to grow and learn. And uh, that that part of the journey, the learning, the constant learning is something that, um, that's part of the fuel that keeps you going. And so if you look at failure as both an opportunity to reflect it's humbling, um, but it is also can be, depending on how you accept it, energizing, because you take that learning and then you are more effective based on the learnings you've gathered. And, and I think that with failure comes that thread of um, lifelong learning. And if you are uh, energized by those opportunities, I mean, why, I just think about coming to work every day and you don't know everything and you're learning from those around you and then, but you are also teaching. And so that dynamic is something that um, when I think of failure now, I just see it as both a uh, challenge and opportunity. Is there any s story of a failure you could share with us that would um, help us understand how a uh, learning that you had from that, how failure can be a teacher too? Oh boy. Um, I remember um, sending in a report and I won't identify the institution and this was the funder. Uh, and this person sat me down and said, uh, I want you to know that the quality of this report is really not what it should have been. And um, it was both uh, an illuminating moment for me um, because it's something that I both had to absorb, but I also knew I had to take that back to team members in the organization because it um, signaled that there was a different expectation um, and so I, you know, considered the quality of that product um, my uh, failure, uh, but then I also used the opportunity to speak the truth. You have to be authentic and uh, share that voice, channel that person's voice to the team to say that this is, this is where we need to be. And um, so it was a humbling moment, but then it became a galvanizing um, opportunity as well. And how, so the tension is always, you know, there's, 
uh, how much failure is okay is mm. you know there's the there's fail fast there's let your people fail and make mistakes so they learn is there a tipping point uh, is it a is it a personal thing like how much i can tolerate in my own self before it becomes too scary you you always have to balance what your own tolerance is and then what will be um nurturing and constructive for your team mm -hmm. uh and there are some people who are uncomfortable in the space uh particularly if they think they're there alone but if you have a group that trusts that they're in it together um i i think that you you take a step back because then it's not about you, but it's it's about creating an environment where people feel like they have the opportunity to stretch. And you don't stretch if you don't feel like you can um, both soar and make a mistake. Mm. You have to have that opportunity. And I think I read a quote from you and I, from one of my team members, and I, if I can find it, um, because it really, um, I think, touches on this subject, um, we were uh, had a luncheon where we were talking about um, a recent uh, accomplishment. And I said that I had to trust the team. It's a big team, the 50 people. There's too many things that you have to do. And I'm not intimately involved in everything. You create ways of working. You have to trust those around you. And they have to trust you as well. And this was the note. Um, I, that I received. Um, I really appreciated what you said about having trust in your team to get the job done. As a member of that team, I can't overstate how much that view has helped me grow as an employee and how feeling that trust, even when it sometimes leads to mistakes, has let me take risks that have enhanced my skill set and connection to our work. With no chance to fail, it's hard to feel success. And I think that captures it. If you don't feel like you can fail, you can't feel like you, you're going to be successful. I love that. And I think that it grows your muscle in, in recovering, in taking bigger risks. It's really, it's a muscle builder. Mm -hmm. it, is, you know, it is a muscle builder because when you think of, um, Again, uh, when I think of the workforce, if there are some who have perfect grades, they come out of school, they expect that same trajectory. And you know what? You may hit a bump. You know, you're in a, a work environment where it's, you're, you may not get an A on everything, and, and that's okay. Uh, and, uh, and that's not the, the end of the world. In fact, um, people want to understand failure so that they can move past them and get better. And so that is, but some people don't believe that you have to build an environment where people start to trust that that's part of the ethos of the organization and there's no penalty. And going back to your earlier question, how much is too much? If it's failure because you've not done the best or you didn't do your research or you're not using data, that's, that's not acceptable. But if you are taking a risk to try something new, you've put all of the, the right elements in place and um, you took the risk and, and took that jump, that's okay. But failure doesn't mean sloppiness. It doesn't mean that you're lazy. It means you, you did the best you could. You did all your background, all your work to, and it didn't fly. But it, that's that's good that's very helpful actually because i've been that's the thing i've been wondering about it's failure when you were at your best so you were doing your best and mm -hmm. it's and your idea didn't work or mm -hmm. thing failed yeah that makes sense and so when you you're still a very young woman but when you look back <laughs> on your on your trajectory so far what do you know now that you wish you knew then, or if this resonates with you more, what advice would you give your younger self? 
Um, you know, I wish I, so the advice I would give my younger self, let me start over, is that you always need to be authentic mm. to your, your true self. Um, you have to trust your gut. You have to um, understand who you are before you are placed in situations. So understand the essence of who you are as a person and you carry that through. And then be confident in the knowledge of who you are and that that is enough to take you into different situations. And um, so that was something I think I would want the, that light bulb to go off sooner. I think you may be walking that path without understanding that those are the elements kind of propelling you forward. And I think that grounding would have made um, uh, just uh, given you even more gravitas. What do you think if you had, if you'd been the younger self and you'd known, I got this, I'm good at this, what would have anything been different for you or just less stress? Um, I think less stress and um, less questioning of yourself, that imposter syndrome, you know, yeah. should you, uh, because sometimes there are opportunities that come to you and, or have came to me and uh, you would think, I, gosh, I mean, I don't know how this opportunity came to me or not realizing that it's based on who you are and uh, you, it does, no one gave you something, you've earned everything. So uh, understanding the distinction between um, being given opportunities, but that with that you have earned opportunities. And so that clarity I think would have been helpful. And have you been in your in your career, your life, been asked, been given opportunities you didn't feel you were ready for that were like, you're like, um, well, I don't know why they're offering this to me. I'm not ready. Um, that's another great question. I think um, I, I had asked, now, I think the, what I would say is I, sometimes I would say, well, I'm surprised right. that um, that opportunity was given to me. And, um, and that may have been where I stopped because I wasn't brave enough to go past that. So that, you know, I would, I would say I'm surprised that I had that. But then I would uh, tell myself, uh, well, I'm going to make the most of being here. Um, so that surprise, uh, I think, carries with it some humility. And, mm -hmm. um, but then you, you think, well, okay, I'm here. And, and then there are times when you think, and I'm supposed to be here. Mm. I love that I'm supposed to be here. So, um, so you, I'm making up, I assume you said yes. They came to you, you thought, your first thought was, what? Yeah. But yeah. You, sa you said, yes. Yeah. So that takes some courage, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. some trust that you'll have what it takes, some believing in the other people that they must see something that you were missing yes. right? or you hadn't yeah. seen. I think so. I'm thinking specifically about women right now, and I, I know it's not unusual for men also, but I know that so my, an issue, uh, a habit that women that we have is um, we think we have more to learn, more to go, we're not ready yet, we haven't got enough information, and um, there's something here that I want to pull out about, you were t you mentioning about, maybe it's even knowing that you're probably smarter, more creative, more competent than you give yourself credit for. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's something there or, yeah, I'm not sure where, where I'm seeing, but I, there's some wish that I have. 
that we would all just know we think we're here but we're yeah. actually out there so just know that you're wrong <laughs> yes exactly exactly that's right the trust that someone may see something in you that you don't see in yourself yes and um and then you have to decide whether you're going to believe that and use that or you can just be in denial and uh push that in that image that reflection or shut down that reflection they have of you um and it is it that it, it's a constant um balancing act because there are people and i know i've been in the position of sharing what i see in people as i've uh, worked with them and i've also been on the receiving end um sometimes believing and sometimes not quite believing what um people have said they've seen in me i like that a lot and it seems like a gift we can keep giving to each other right? yes pointing Absolutely. out those things yes are there things that you wish that young women knew now that you like any three things you wish young women could take on board that would help them that are women that are up and coming leaders uh you know one of the things that i wish they knew um is and this is something I've learned over the years is that your strength can be coupled with kindness mm. and, uh, that you can be hard charging, but you can, um, that coupled with that is your, your kindness and empathy. And because that makes you a welcoming person. And it also, um, creates that, aura around you that helps people to, you know, again, trust who you are. And so I believe in treating people the way that they're supposed to be treated. Um, I've been treated well throughout my career and I try to reflect that um, and try to um, channel those who were mentors to me. And um, I think I told you the story when I was coming out of school and I was writing letters on a electric typewriter to really date myself. And uh, uh, there was a man who was vice president at Hopkins, um, uh, Rip Haley, who he, he answered my letter and I was shocked. And then I had an appointment um, and uh, you know, so it worked. All the things that they tell you should work. And and I sat down and he said, we, I don't have um, anything now, but at that point, Peabody had just affiliated with Hopkins, um, the Peabody Conservatory. And he said, there will be a position there. And I've never forgotten that um, as someone coming out of school, being given that opportunity. And when people reach out to you and reach out to me, I continue to respond, remembering how people responded to me and uh, you, and that is something you want your younger self to also know that you are in a position, no matter how junior you are, you, you too can give something back. You too can um, continue that thread of helping each other. You have something to share. And um, that's just something I've, uh, carried with me low these many years and continue to um, try to, you know, enact in my professional and personal life. I love that you said the professor's name too, because in that way we get to honor him mm -hmm. for doing that for you. Um, anything else that you wish younger women that you think would be good for younger women to know that we might not have touched on? Um, you know, I think the other, one of the other things that I would share is that you should be comfortable in your own transparency, um, and, um, but also understand that when you're not accepted or you feel resistance, that you don't question yourself, understand 
the, you know, the motivation, the motivators that may be creating behaviors in others. And uh, so it's, it's that it's not you. Um, it could be, um, it has nothing to do with you. You could be prompting um, uh, a reaction from someone based on their own shortcomings. And so again, being grounded in who you are, and that is something, and to be both uh, humble, um, but always be curious. Mm -hmm. Let your curiosity lead you to the next thing. Let your curiosity help you to improve where you are, help your, curi your curiosity should be leading you to um, other things and ways to both improve and, and move. And so I would just say, you know, celebrate that curiosity as you keep going. So when you're talking about, you know, other people's reactions to you, and I'm thinking, you know, uh, for women, that's carrying one that can react, cause people to react one way. And then being women of color, there's layers added on to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, being curious is hard to bring that forth in those moments sometimes mm -hmm. when you feel like you're being, not being seen. Yes. If somebody's coming at you with things that don't have to do with you personally, but you're there, the one who's there, right? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, what, you know, one of the things that I, as a woman of color, uh, you, I carry the knowledge with me, um, and it may be my own absorption of understanding bias that I have to or I felt like I've had to balance um, my own um, method of communication, which is both direct and um, but empathetic, and um, and not be seen as the angry black woman. Um, and uh, there are stereotypes, uh, and you and you may see that in a room. Uh, you may understand that it's there, and then you have to understand, you know, just going back to the art of war, how are you going to deal with that? You know, how much energy are you going to use, and what's the most direct way to deal with it? Because I like to suss things out and get them on the table, um, because that's better for you, um, and uh, you have to take the risk to do that. But I, I find that... Um, those are, I am, I have my antenna ready because the, the world is a very complex place. Um, and, uh, but I'm not fearful hmm. of that. I just understand that um, people are different and, um, and we all, we all have unconscious biases. Right. That requires quite a bit of, of individual growth and development to get to that place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Self-awareness. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Self-awareness and, um, and grit and strength. Grit. Yeah. I love grit. I, you don't, I don't hear grit very often, but I love that word. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We also, the last time we talked to you, we were talking about mentors and sponsors. And uh, we, the question we were talking about was, what did you learn from them? Mm. Um, so I, when I think of my time at Spellman and um, with Dr. Cole, who I remember her saying, I think you're, you're not I'm ready to be the vice president, but I'm creating an associate vice president's role and I'd like you to take this on. Um, I watched her move through a complex environment, um, but she did it in a way where her eye was always on the prize. And here's someone who was pulled in many different ways. And um, we were raising money for the sciences at Spelman, but there were certainly other needs. Everyone had an opinion, 
but she managed to finesse um, and keep everyone on that road, if you will, uh, while keeping blinders on to understand this is this is what we need to do. This is our goal. And uh, so it was a wonderful um, uh, visual for me to, uh, as I've moved through the years and how she, for me, it helped me to understand what are the things that you can control? What do you control? And that can help you to create your, your own roadmap uh, of where you need to go. Um, and so I consider her uh, to be a wonderful mentor. And then um, my um, previous position at Volunteers of America, I worked with a phenomenal woman, uh, Jatrice Martel Gator, um, who uh, was the executive vice president. And she's a larger than life personality, um, an extrovert, uh, very skilled. And uh, I am I function like an extrovert, but I'm an introvert. I can be very cerebral. And, uh, and um, she understood my priorities with my son and a family. And, but at some point she started and pushing me out. And, and that for me, it meant, you know, I would say, well, there's this opportunity for leadership Arlington or leadership Greater Washington. And she said, you need to do those things. These were my own personal development um, goals. And she said, because you've got, you have the job, you're, you've, you have your family, you've been focused, uh, but your son is older. And she made me understand that you just can't be comfortable. Hmm. And, uh, and so I, um, I mean, she really, and networking, um, celebrating that networking, uh, coming back and saying, I think I want to, I saw an opportunity to be on um, the Morgan Stanley gift for their Global Impact Funding Trust Board. And I said, I'm going to ask them. And so that really came, she sparked that. Uh, and so you, you may think that, you know, you're of a certain age and you're doing certain things and you're coasting along, but you know what? There's always something else, that question mark on the road that I described. And uh, that, that she was a wonderful uh, mentor uh, for me and remains so. I want to pull out, because I love it, you can't be comfortable. You can't be comfortable. So what does that mean to you? Uh, it, it means you have to stay connected. For me, mm -hmm. it means that you're always connecting. You're always um, uh, discovering something. You're challenging yourself. And I, I understand that some people, for some people, the same, they like doing the same thing over and over again, being in the same environment. But for me, I found what um, fuels me and sparks my own creativity is not being comfortable or working towards that comfort. And so it's the work of getting from A to B. It's the work of trying to um, help an organization or a team evolve. It's, that's what it's about. It's not just about the dollars. It's about how are you moving um, systems, organizations, people, so that you can get to another place. And that connectivity, that energy, that's something that I really enjoy. I enjoy, you know, taking voice lessons from a younger woman. I, and you, I just enjoy having that, um, that kind of, those challenges, mini challenges, and they don't always have to be huge. They're mm. little. And, um, and the small, the small ones are, uh, even this morning I, I woke up and the, I worked out with a trainer and I, she must be, uh, oh, she just turned 30. <laughs> and, and, uh, she said, well, I hear 30 could be my best year. And I said, oh my goodness, there's so many years. <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
but you know, even being challenged by her is something that you, you, that's part of the joy of um, moving in this world. Yeah, I like how also being uncomfortable goes with being okay to fail. Mm -hmm. It goes with having courage, even small, small things, which I appreciate your um, bringing that in. It doesn't have to be things that make you want to, you know, think you're going to lose your lunch because you're so scared. Right, exactly. Just, exactly. And I think the more we take those risks that we put ourselves in being uncomfortable, the bigger we get. Yes. You know, the more we think we can do. It's like, it's self-empowering, which, you know, it's better to self, to empower your own self personally, yes. I think. Exactly. Because yeah. then it's true. Then, then it's, it's true. yours. You own it. Uh, and it's authentic because it's yours. And that goes back to what we're talking about failure. Your the quote that you read earlier, the letter from your staff person, um, which I don't know if I can find. With no chance to fail, it is hard to feel successful or success. Yes. Which is for yourself too. Yes. Which I was thinking about it. That's what a gift you give to others, and now I'm coming to, and this is a gift you give yourself. Also. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah, no, and that's that's the that's the spark. That's the spark. I'm getting goosebumps. That's a good, good. sign. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> goosebumps is a positive thing. Yes, that's great. <laughs> Anything that we haven't um, touched on that you would want to share? Um, you know, I I think. The other thing that I, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, being authentic and, uh, but I, and I also think you have to live, be grateful. Mm. And uh, so if you're living and walking, walking a path of gratitude, um, you are grateful for opportunities and you're grateful for those small steps because those things are to be celebrated and, um, and the, the big wins, the small wins, uh, and, but you can let that sense of gratitude, that should infuse you and, uh, and you share that with others. And so be, being grateful for where you are, how you're owning where you are, and that's something in sharing with, um, younger colleagues that you, I mean, you, you can power, you are the, you can power your own ship. And so where, where do you want to be? And so that gratitude is something that I would put with kindness and strength and um, uh, because that acknowledges and celebrates where you are. Um, it doesn't mean that you're going to only rest on your laurels, but you need to be grateful for where you are so that you can understand where you can go. And and appreciate where you are because it is a it's a gift. Even if you worked hard mm -hmm. for it, it's still it's still a gift. And mm -hmm. if we're not grateful, it feels like we would miss the moment. You know, Absolutely. you keep going to the next thing, the next thing and we're missing the moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to be grateful um, because and if you are that means that you really are you're reflecting on where you are you're absorbing the moment you're in the moment uh, and however long that moment is and um, and these are things that anyone can do I mean you don't have to be able to hop on a plane and go to Paris you hit you can own your space of gratitude and use that to um, help you create your own roadmap for success. Do you have any practices that you use that help you remember to be grateful? I, um, I, I don't meditate, uh, but I do spend quiet time. And I, you know, it sounds, uh, a little maudlin, but I am 
um, you can be, I can be moved by so many small things. And so that is, um, those are the things I recognize and celebrate. And whether it's uh, great music, we had a music director who was um, at our church who left uh, moving uh, back to Arizona. And we shared a song and said goodbye and the harmonies were so wonderful. And in that moment, it that was a gift. And uh, you, so I just, I don't know. I. I am appreciative of things that touch you and you're open enough where you can um, absorb those good things that are around you. And I think it gives you some reservoir to uh, weather um, any difficult times. And we're in a very chaotic environment and uh, where you can feel fatigue you know, how much can you do? There's so many needs in the world. How can you help? Uh, and, but these, these little things are things that I think can um, help to both propel you and envelop you and let you know that um, you are, there's still good things happening. It sounds like you, it's part of your, your habit. So you have it integrated into how you see the world. And then also listening to you, I, I understand that it gives resilience. It helps you be resilient yeah. to what's the other things that are going on. And uh -huh. I imagine in your position as development and fundraising, that would be such a weight. Oh, there's so much need and like, it's up to you to come up with the funds and you and your staff. Yeah. And support um, that, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's no ego. If you're a fundraiser, you have no ego because you have to, sometimes people say yes, sometimes they say no. And uh, so there's, you walk a path of humility, but you're also creative. And, and the other thing that you do is you're building on relationships. You're always building relationships. And so that is, um, that can be a gift. Um, so you're humbled by those opportunities to connect with people. Um, we recently had an event uh, where we brought supporters and donors together. And one of the images that stood out in my mind, there was a young woman who may have been 30-ish uh, uh, talking to uh, an, uh, a more seasoned uh, woman who may have been um, 80 and but they were there because they believed in the organization and the picture of the two of them um, yeah. chatting and uh you know sharing that value that brought them together walking coming from different paths is something that um is very inspiring so that those are the things you remember even with the backdrop of nose and uh feeling pressure to meet your goals and uh so those are things that you it kind of smooth the, the rough edges of a day or a month or, you know, the moments that you encounter. I like that. I like that. Uh, so we're getting to the end of our time. Any final thoughts? Um, God, I, you know, I've enjoyed the conversation and it, this has given me an opportunity to reflect and that in itself is a gift too. And uh, so um, thank you. Well, thank you, Shelly. Thank you for taking the time and for being so generous with your, with your thoughts and your experience. And I am very much looking forward to getting your voice in, out there in the way that I can help get it out there. So thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you so much.